If you're watching this video, you're probably in year 11 or 12 this year. So you've been in school and in the schooling system for about 12 years now. But if I asked you to describe to me the process of learning, would you be able to do that? Would you be able to go through each step that your brain goes through in order to actually learn something and hold that information and then hold that information and then be able to apply that to a certain scenario or a certain test or a certain environment? Would you be able to describe that process? Now, most students I ask this to, they're not able to describe the process and that's perfectly fine and that makes sense because you can still learn things without actually understanding the process of learning. Because for example, when you grew up from a baby to a toddler and from a toddler to whatever else is after that, you were able to learn things. You were able to learn how to communicate, how to ask for things and then you learned you know, English and then you learned proper actions and then you learn how to eat and then you learn how to drink. All of these things you learned without understanding the process of learning. And you're learning something right now. You've learned things today, you've learned things yesterday and you're going to continue to learn things. But wouldn't it make sense that if you understood how your brain actually worked and how your brain actually learns things, then we can use that information to optimize the process and then optimize and be an efficient learner in the way that we learn things that we want to learn or we learn the important things and then we ignore the unimportant things. So if you understand the process of learning, then you're able to apply whatever skills are involved in learning and use it to your advantage. So that's what we're gonna go through in this maybe three or four part series. I'm not sure how many videos it's gonna be, but we're gonna divide up the learning process into its different stages. And the first stage is just the process of taking external stimuli and interpreting that information. So I'll give you an example of a couple of things that maybe happened to you today or maybe happened to you in the past week, but these are things that definitely happen to most people. Now, the first one is, let's say you had a really important conversation with a friend or a parent or a coworker or something like that. So it's a really important conversation. It might've been about some drama in the group or something like that. You'd probably be able to recall that information relatively well, and you'd be able to almost live back that moment. So what happened was your brain learned what happened and it remembered what happened because your brain found that thing important. So the conversation was important to you, so therefore you were able to remember that information without this extra repetition. But let's say you had a really quick encounter with your neighbor on the way to school. So let's say you talked to your neighbor before school, you had a quick hi, quick bye, but would you remember your neighbor's shoe color? Now you probably didn't because your neighbor's shoe color is not that important to you and it's not that important to your life. So you don't hold a high weight to it, therefore you didn't remember it. Now it's interesting that your brain probably encountered those scenarios for an equivalent amount of time. It probably wasn't too long that you talked to your neighbor and it probably wasn't too long that you had a chat with your friend or your coworker about an important topic. But your brain decided to remember one thing more so than the other. So how do we leverage this to our advantage and how do we ensure that we're actually taking in but also be able to retain that important information and that important information comes from what our teacher is telling us and what our school is trying to teach us as well. Now I'm just going to define attention in a learning context really quickly. I'm just going to read it off my paper here. Attention is the cognitive process of selectively focusing on specific aspects of the environment while ignoring others. So this kind of makes sense and we can link it back to the previous example that I talked about. The attention that you placed on your neighbor's shoes is not as important as the attention that you placed on the conversation that you had that was an important one with your friend. So there was less importance placed on your neighbor's shoes, therefore you decided not to remember that. So what's important or what you should kind of consider when you're learning things and when you're listening to things is that if you place a high importance on it, you're more likely to remember it. So a lot of people go into school and they go into, let's say, a specific class and they don't like the teacher that they have. So what commonly happens is that when you don't like a teacher, you place less importance on what they're actually saying. So when you place a less importance on what they're saying, you're less likely to remember it because you don't have that specific need to remember it anymore because your brain is subconsciously thinking that you don't need to remember it anymore because you didn't place a high importance on what your teacher is saying and you didn't place a high importance on uh, the classroom environment that you're in. So straight away, we notice a problem or I've noticed a problem with a lot of students that I've had in the past. It's where they think their teacher is bad. This is a really common example, by the way, so that's why I'm bringing it up. But they have a really bad teacher and maybe they taught one or two concepts not that well 
and then therefore they didn't pay attention to them at all anymore and they wanted to learn everything independently which is completely fine i completely encourage learning independently and most people would agree with that but the problem is is that you're not going to remember anything from your teacher anymore because you placed a really low importance on what they're saying but this is kind of a topic for a different video but even if your teacher is not good, they're still going to teach you things and they're still going to fill in the puzzle piece that all the knowledge comes together in and they're going to play a part in your learning as well, regardless of how good or bad they are. So usually when it comes to good teachers, it's not necessarily that the students are remembering more of what they're saying because they're good teachers. It's a fact that the bad teachers might not be as good as teaching, so therefore students place less importance on what they're saying and therefore students will just not recall anything that the teacher said. So it's kind of a negative feedback loop or a negative snowball effect. Now, humans will prioritize certain stimuli over others depending on a lot of examples. I have a couple of examples listed here I'll just read out. So I have the relevance to them, the significance to them, the personal interest to them, and many more factors after that. But they're probably the main three that a lot of people can relate to. So when you talk about the relevance to, to a topic, a lot of people might see certain subjects as not so relevant to them in their lives or maybe their long-term goals or their long-term vision. A lot of, there's this really big stigma around maths when it comes to a lot of people and they say, where does maths apply in my life or where is maths going to be applied in my life where I actually need to recall the quadratic formula or something like that. This is what a lot of students say and it kind of causes people to not have the importance placed on something and therefore they're not going to be able to learn it because that stimuli is deemed as unimportant in the back of their minds. So just think that when you're learning something at school or when you need to learn something at school, everything is equally important. Uh, actually, no, not everything is equally important. Things are all important and then you might place some priority on some rather than others. And you should establish that in your mind and you should actively think about that when you're going into a subject. And the reason why I say that not all subjects are equally important is because if you're watching this from Victoria, then you know that the top four subjects, one of them being English, is going to be the, the main one that contributes to your ATAR. And then the other two subjects or the other one subject that you do is only going to contribute an extra 10%. So it makes sense that you place the highest importance on four subjects that you think you're going to do the best at, one of them being English. And then the other ones, you still consider somewhat important in your mind, but you don't place as much emphasis or maybe you don't place as much active time on them. And then as a, as a result of that, you're most likely not going to actively want to learn as much of, as much of that subject as the other ones. And it's, it's kind of a good thing because then you could just focus on the top four and you could focus on your um, English and then that would be the optimal way to boost your ATAR. It's because you're focusing on you know, what's worth the most and then you're giving less care to the things that aren't worth as much. It just makes sense from you know, an algebraic standpoint. Now, the next factor is the significance. So this is more so about maybe the overall significance in someone's life. So is learning this topic actually going to affect my life in a positive way? Now, obviously most people in the schooling system would say yes, but then there might be some people where they might not see schooling as so important or maybe their ATAR requirement for their, for their course is quite low compared to what they're expected to get. But you'll notice that people usually get ATARs that are quite close to their, their benchmark score for their degree. And that's because in their mind, they've kind of set this expectation for themselves where they might be aiming for a 95 or 96, but I only need an 85 for my course. So I don't need to try that hard. But what you'll tend to notice is that those people tend to perform closer to their course requirement because in their mind, they've already set that expectation for themselves and they've already set the significance of the, of the learning process on themselves. And therefore they're kind of gonna dial back the amount that they remember and the amount of knowledge that they retain. So it's actually important to note that your expectations and what significance you place on what you're learning, that expectation that you set on it has a strong impact on how much you actually remember of the stimuli. So just keep that in mind whenever you're learning something or when you're paying attention in class or reading the textbook or whatever you're doing to enhance your knowledge in year 11 or year 12, is that the significance that you place on learning something has a strong impact on how much you actually remember of that. So just to summarize, there's stimuli and when we absorb stimuli, that's essentially the learning process. And sometimes stimuli is absorbed better than other stimuli. And you know, some main factors that cause stimuli to be absorbed better than others is relevance to your life, the significance in your life, and just personal interest as well.
But let's say we're just trying to study something, right? And we're just trying to absorb as much information as possible. How do we actually do that? So there's a concept called attentive resources, and it's essentially, essentially you can think about it as the mental fuel tank or your cognitive load. So when you're studying something, let's say you're studying something at the library, and sometimes it's busy and it's loud, and there's a lot of distraction, and sometimes it's quiet, and there's not much noise in the background. In the noisy environment, what happens is that you reserve some of your mental load or your cognitive load, that's allocated to filtering out that noise, and therefore you have a limited amount of cognitive load that focuses on actually learning the content and absorbing that stimuli. But let's say if you're in a quiet environment, then there's no excess cognitive load reserved, to filtering out the noise and the amount of cognitive load that you have allocated to learning the content is maximized. So this is a really important concept when learning and it's kind of a self-explanatory thing if you think about it and it's very intuitive. You wanna minimize the distractions around you because your cognitive load is actually occupied by these things. So for example, noise is a big factor. We also have you know, just a visual clutter. If you have a messy desk, then that's kind of occupying some of your mental load as well. And a really big one that a lot of people face nowadays is obviously the distraction of the phone and having notifications on and just the phone being around is just a distraction for a lot of people, which makes sense because it is a big part of our lives now. But if you remove noise, clutter and your phone and you move it away from the vicinity of which you're studying in, then what happens is that your cognitive load for distractions is reduced and therefore the cognitive load reserved to what you're studying is maximized. And that's what we want because therefore the stimuli can be absorbed the best and you're more likely to remember the information that's actually important to you. Apart from focusing on one thing at a time, the other factor that will affect your cognitive load is just tiredness. So if you're studying in a tired state, then your cognitive load just decreases. You probably notice this when you're trying to study or when you're trying to focus on anything late at night, it can definitely be hard for a lot of people and that's purely because your cognitive load is reduced at that time to prepare you for sleep. So that's why that happens. So a lot of time I just recommend if you're starting to feel tired, then you're not at an optimal state to be studying in and to retain information. So I would just recommend start winding down for bed and go to sleep and uh, wake up nice and early the next day, nice and fresh. Now this last point I'll touch on is actually very interesting. It's that if something is new, then the stimuli will actually be very strong and you're more likely to remember that thing. So it makes sense a lot of the time. So if I told you that one plus one equals two, you're most likely not going to remember that I said that because you already knew that that was the case. But if you just learn something new, then it's actually more likely to be memorized. But this, it might not seem like that at first. And this is because usually new things are deemed more difficult in our minds and more difficult things are harder to retain. So if you perceive something as not so difficult and it's new, you're more likely to remember it compared to if you perceive it as something that's extremely difficult. So what I would say is don't perceive new things as difficult because that's not always the case. Everything in school and everything in how VC is structured is that everything progresses at a certain and a steady rate so that the jumps aren't too high and everything's actually manageable and maintainable. So Again, don't see everything new as just an extreme challenge or an extreme difficulty because it's actually not. It's designed to be taken at a step-by-step -step route. Now, the interesting thing about learning new things just in general is the novelty behind it actually causes the stimuli. But what the research also suggests is that if you learn something from a different source, then that is also cause for a novelty. And that causes people to absorb the information a lot better and for the stimuli to be a lot more effective. So for example, if you're listening to your teacher and your teacher is not that good, then what people usually do is they go to other sources and go to other places for information to actually learn things. So for example, if their teacher is not that good, then they might go on our website to see our free resources. I'm not plugging in or anything, but if you want, uh, we have VC Methods resources for free in the bio. Uh, so we have our resources, we have Khan Academy, you have the textbook, you have your teacher, you have other teachers that not, might not be your own. There's so many different places that you can receive new information and your brain sees that as a novelty thing and therefore the stimuli is more likely to be absorbed better and more likely to be retained for future usage. So that's actually, yeah, that's really interesting to me because a lot of people see going to external places for resources as purely just a way of getting better information. But 
the way that your brain interprets that information, it might not be it might not be better absorbed because the source was better. It was more so just because you went to a different source in the first place. I don't know. That I just find it really fascinating. And I guess you do have a twofold benefit that if your teacher is not that good, then you can go to other sources and you can get better information. And at the same time, you're accessing this new source that your brain sees as new stimuli and therefore is more likely to be absorbed and that information to be retained. So that's something that I recommend anyway regardless of this research is that you should find multiple sources of information for all your VCE subjects so go online see what resources are out there for free suss out a tutor if you if you want to pay for something but I wouldn't say it's you know completely necessary read the textbook independently go through practice exams independently and not only is this stimuli all very new but you're making this puzzle piece of this knowledge and you're taking pieces from everywhere and then combining it together you have a full a vast array of information and a full picture of what you need to know to really be a master of whatever you're trying to study. To summarize this video, I'll give you three actionable takeaways. The first one is when you're studying, study something that you enjoy and if that's out of your control, make sure you just think about the intention behind why you're actually studying something. This will allow your brain to actually understand the importance of what you're studying and therefore the stimuli will be absorbed better in your brain for future usage. The second thing would be to remove all distractions as possible. So the ones that you can control are the environment that you're studying in. Make sure you study in a quiet environment and a clean environment and also study away from your phone as well. Make sure that your phone is out of reach. Put it in another room, turn it off, do whatever you need to do to kind of remove that from your space and remove that from your mind. Therefore, your cognitive load for these distractions will be reduced and the cognitive load that you focus on your studying will be maximized. My last tip would be use multiple sources of information to actually build up a big picture in your mind and allow your brain to absorb stimuli from multiple places. This allows for novelty to take place and the new way of thinking and the new way of presenting information from multiple sources allows your brain to understand things a lot better and get a full picture of what's going on. So the four main places that you can get information from is by listening to your teacher. Even if your teacher's bad, please still listen to your teacher because you're going to learn some things from them. It might not be a full picture if they're not that good, but you'll still learn something. So listen to your teacher, read the textbook independently, look for free resources online, VC methods resources we have for free on our website, and also have a look at a tutor if that's actually gonna help you. So those four places will provide you with more than enough information and more than enough stimuli to be able to retain the information perfectly to be able to apply that into Saxon exams.